and we're live. <laughs> well, so here we are, Shantaram Reading Group, week two. And we've got myself, Marco Morelli, David, uh, Jamie, and Paul on the line with us. And we're going to be talking about pages roughly 100 to 200 uh, of, yep. of Shantaram. Uh, we've all introduced ourselves in the first call, so I don't think we need to to go into that necessarily. And um, all of us are either, I guess, mountain or Pacific time. So it's kind of later in the day for us. We're unwinding a little bit. David's got the Campari, did you say? <laughs> I'm, I'm waking up from an, from an afternoon, late afternoon nap. Uh, at least here in Colorado, it's been rainy all week and the sun has finally come out. Uh, so it's kind of glorious out. And I think you can see that in the smile on David's face. <laughs> and, and my nudie patootie little baby rattling to get off the porch and go door to door for, I don't know, Cub Scouts or uh, the Democratic Party or something. He's like eager to cut loose here. He's, he's ready to take on the world. He's, he's had bath time and <laughs> the world is his oyster. <laughs> so, um, David, uh, yeah. what do you Thank think? You. Thank you. Person? Well, it's, um, you know, what a privilege to to be called a co-host and to be able to, uh, to help kind of set the frame for, uh, for these continuing calls. The first, uh, the first one, uh, first call was just wonderful. It's so nice to meet everyone and such a rich diversity of people. And I got a lot, I was just reflecting again, Marco of, of, um, how rich it is for those of us who really like this, for whom reading isn't just a solitary thing, but we love once we've processed it to re-engage, um, the collective field of reading and, and engaging with literature. And, and so it was just a, it was such a, a refreshing reminder after the weeks beforehand, grinding through details and prepping and all that. And the, certainly the world you live in, you know, making this whole structure possible that, you know, for me, it really, it's just the next um, concentric ring of value that I get out of, um, these gifts that authors give us, and this book especially being so relevant for me. Um, the first meeting was kind of stunning for me, just to get to know each person, and um, the comments were gems, and they made me think more deeply, and they challenged me, and you and I had a really nice little, um, I, I felt called to feel into a little bit more deeply uh, what was also incredibly um, challenging and painful about those first hundred pages. Um, and so I'm just, I'm grateful to be here. What, what wonderful people. And, um, you know, I, I held this expectation because I communicated this opportunity, at least in my networking about it to, I mean, not counting testing, buying Facebook ads and whatever, which was maybe silly, but interesting, um, you know, communicating to hundreds of people and then having conversation with, um, 20, 30 people. Hey, that sounds interesting. Tell me more, whatever. And then it made its way down to, we've actually had maybe 12 to 15 people commit in one form or another or register. Um, and maybe they'll follow along. Maybe they'll show up in forums and we've had people around the world, four or five in my world that can't be part of it. But, um, it was a great discovery to see that whatever the size here, um, this is just really a great way to further honor my passion for this, this book um, specifically and, and reading in general. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I, I uh, just to require, respond to that uh, uh, quickly before we open up a, a conversation. Um, oh, and there's Pam. Yeah. Hey, Pam. We're just getting started. Um, one of the things I think that is um, uh, interesting is that I think culturally we expect that we do things alone. Like we expect that reading is a solid, that's kind of how we understand it is that it's a private activity that you do with yourself. You curl up with a book and you kind of create this like, you know, micro intimate micro sphere uh, with yourself and the literature. And that gives you some access to, to the author uh, or to the world that might be, you know, created uh, through, through the work. Um, but uh, certainly like in one of the themes that we, that uh, is written about in, or that, we, that we've been reading about uh, in this last week has to do with this kind of communal aspect to life, which uh, in the book is 
most embodied in the village, uh, which which uh, Lynn lives in for for a number of months, and the and the way that village life and village uh, relationality uh, and relationships are um, are are configured or, or carried out or lived or felt too, uh, and. So that, of course, is one of the things that we've lost, that we've lost a, 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 that kind of um, communal intimacy and that kind of shared experience. Uh, and if, I, mean, I, I, I want to talk about it a bit more. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to kind of go too far out before, because um, there's some really interesting things that happen in the village and experiences that, that Lynn has, which sort of break down that modern Western separate individual who's like in control of their reality um which he kind of has that attitude at, at certain and he recognizes that that in, in himself and um and i and i think that um with like a reading group and like getting people together to read together and to like slow down enough uh and to sort of br- bridge that divide between the solitary intimate self and the, sep- the separate self and then the communal self. Um, and to do that on the, ba- that, that's a, I think it's so contrary actually to um, the direction of things uh, that, um, that if we just have two people show up and, and do it, it would be worth it to me. Uh, and I would continue doing it because, uh, because it has, I think a level of preciousness uh, potentially, you know, if we, really invest it with, with um, our hearts in the way that uh, Lynn does in, into the world that he describes in the book, uh, then uh, it's, it's, uh, it gives access to a different kind of depth, I think. Uh, we can call it depth. Maybe, I don't know if that's a great, the right or the great word, a great word for it. But, um, but I, mean, I certainly feel like that we kind of activate a shared field like when we read together and you need at least two people for a field, but then you have three, four, five, it starts to uh, become more multidimensional and, and interesting because we each have bring our personal perspectives to it. Um, but that field is, um, is sort of primary. And if, you know, we can have it with the author, with the work and with the sort of silent community of other readers who are out there that you never connect with. Uh, but then we could also, I think, um, like activate it like between ourselves and that's kind of what we're what we're doing now so i appreciate your introductory comments for for kind of bringing that forth um and and i'd love to explore how that really how that plays out uh for each of us in the text or in relation to the text it's beautiful yeah um, lots of ways to move into this and and marco and i contemplated uh you know formalizing it a bit actually um, identifying core questions, you know, about the plot movement, etc. But th- it seemed to work so well the last time, just naturally kind of um, either going round robin or just opening it up. Um, it might be a nice way to um, to start today's meeting by, by way of, since we've already done, done the um, who we are kind of check-in, to just uh, start out with a, if, if we could playfully as a constraint of this exercise, just, you know, take no more than two or three minutes and just say how we felt about this ne- next chunk. Um, th- maybe, you know, if, if possibilities are things I love, things that challenged me, um, things I'm left with, um, anything like that. But maybe let's just go around and maybe Jamie, Paul, Pam, Marco, and myself and kind of go in that order if you guys are up for that. Sure. Sounds good. I guess I was called on first. Um, Okay, so I really love this part because uh, when he goes and visits Pravaka's village and um, Pravaka's mom gives him the new name, like I literally got tears in my eyes (laughs) as I heard that part. Um, So yeah, just I'm really falling in the love falling in love with the way that he's just diving into their culture um, and really earning that uh, loving relationship. It's not um, just a business relationship with him. You can tell that they're becoming friends. And I like how they talk about how um, people in India really know how to love. 
Um, so that just like kind of touches me. That's kind of how I am. So I'm definitely finding uh, a lot of things that I'm feeling like I have in common with um, Lynn and, you know, getting his new name and everything. So I really like that part. Um, and then the last chapter that we just finished with him kind of explaining his escape and uh he has a lot more courage than I ever would. <laughs> but um, yeah, that was just really interesting to kind of hear everything that was on at risk for him. And then, you know, the new things that he's starting to get involved with. Um, I started to list, listen to the next chapter and I had to stop because I was like, I don't want to talk about it. But it's just really interesting how the story is evolving and how we're just really learning so much about the um, initial characters and I'm excited to keep going. I can't wait. After this, I'm going to listen to more. So. It's awesome. It's awesome. Paul, you up for following on? Sure. Um, I I also felt um and sort of feel pulled in by the loving quality of the um the the elements amongst the characters. I noticed it during the very beginning of the book, and um, I guess I'm noticing that at certain times I and pulled to surrender into some of the um, emotional intensity that for me sort of stretches my heart into different chambers. I don't have the experience of that kind of village community in my background. And yet I thought the writing and the um, uh, interactions with the characters and the scenes were so powerful that um, I really let it, let it draw me in. And then the, the, I'm also noticing I like how the author is presenting um, what I would call synchronicities um, without um, calling them as such or making a big deal, such with the the fire right after the arrival in the slum that then propelled Lynn into his doctor role, which, you know, kind of happened somewhat accidentally with the with the fire. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm liking the way that those events are shown to sort of lead um, potential disaster to somebody else's, you know, emergence character. And then um, uh, that sense of the furthering of that um, deep community experience uh, in the slum, that I have to say that it felt quite claustrophobic to me. I'm, I, I am, um, have been living a more hermit style lifestyle for the last three or four years and actually kind of um, just reintegrating into more community, more, more collectives of people again. Um, but that uh, it's, it actually, I, I can tell it, if it kind of makes me a little nervous just as I start to really put the book down and image and, and try to get the sense of all the sounds and the closeness and all of that. And, um, Several times I put the book down to try and let my imagination go 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 with me rather than just keep reading the content because I can feel like something is making me feel itchy scratchy. I thought, oh, I better see what that is. So, <laughs> hey, Paul, for those of us who actually boarded these trains without the help of the seven foot guy with the sharp elbows, I can tell you. Uh, you know, I think I spent days trying to find that same space that you talk about taking from the narrative. <laughs> well, I feel complete for now. So mm. next. That's wonderful. Hey, Pam. Hi. Well, you know, one of the reasons I have not had an interest in going to India is because of just that. You know, I have this image of the press of people, you know, and, um, and the humidity, which I don't, I live in, you know, live in the Southwest. I like dryness. I grew up back East outside Philly. And even growing up, I hated the humility, uh, the, hum the humidity. I went to New Orleans for four years. I hated the humidity <laughs> anyway. So, you know, so I have all these things. So I'm wrestling as like, and I knew that from the beginning of reading the book, I already sort of had a resistance, but at the same time, and partly this was a this was a disruptor move for me. I think I might have mentioned that last night, time, but um, but I'm also really drawn. I've always been drawn to the spiritual aspect of India uh, very much. So it's always been a sort of push pull thing for me. Um, and uh, I, I'm 
I too am getting more and more drawn into it and falling in love with the characters and, and feeling moved. I one of the, the seminal points for me was actually when the fire happened and he was about to grab his stuff and bail. And then, you know, the villagers are looking at him like, really? And he goes, oh, and then he, you know, I was, I could so relate to that, you know, that sort of, which way am I going to go here? And, um, and feel very much that sort of Western, uh, I don't know, sort of isolationism kind of side to me. Um, you know, many years ago, I, I, I thought I was going to go live in some kind of intentional community. It's why I went to Israel. It's why we explored intentional communities up the east, up the west coast. Um, and I was researching it a fair amount. And then I, we moved out to Utah from California. And I ended up having a kind of work where I was in a tribal environment all the time. We were working in the wilderness with kids, uh, Good troubles or young adults. And so I was sitting in circles around the fire every week. Um, I didn't, after about the first eight months where I actually went out with them, I didn't do that. I'd come and go. But, uh, but it was a rich, powerful time. And I think it's sort of, uh, what's that? Something broke me of sucking eggs. I forget. I don't know if I have that term quite right. But anyway. Um, and now I'm at this, I can't imagine, you know, doing an intentional community thing. Um, so it's interesting just, you know, bringing my own stuff to the book and reading it. Um, um, and, and having it reflect back to me, my current state, my current biases and, and, um, and affections and all that. Well, the other thing that struck me is how much touch there is in this book. He's always talking about people. Touch it. <laughs> Look at Paul. Paul's eyes got big. <laughs> Which I actually am fairly touching myself. So that to me is like, oh, that's nice. You know, I notice when I'm around my mother, she's not a very touchy person. So I'm the one reaching out to connect, you know. And so it's interesting just to just to notice that other part of, you know, the culture, how much of connection there is. And then the last part, I actually had read much of the first part of it earlier, but the last part I'm right, right, is where he meets the, uh, the guru head mafia guy and has that whole thing. And uh, uh, anyway, I just, I, I'm looking forward to seeing the next phase of that because it's interesting to have this mafia guy who also appears to be a pretty wise guy at the same time. So I'm like, hmm, this is, this is sort of interesting. Anyway, that's my initial riff. <laughs> cool. Is it my turn, David? All right. Uh, <clears throat> oh, I don't know even where to go with this. Um, I mean, one thing, I like that we're reflecting personally. Um, in the philosophy call, other reading group, the philosophy call, calls, uh, the personal kind of cr gets in there but it's much more intellectual and much more sort of history of ideas and theology, metaphysics, etc. cetera. And um, one, of the, when, one of my experiences with this book so far is that it's a relief <laughs> from uh, my, a lot of the other activities that I'm engaged in mentally, which um, are, take me into a more abstract or more complicated space state or space uh where you know either i'm trying to organize something or i'm trying to express a complex idea or um you know try trying to deal with like interpersonal relationships that are like multi-layered and uh subtle and uh require this you know very uh our intimate calculus of like you know how to craft communication language etc and there's something a lot easier about uh, this book that I appreciate. It's like one of the easiest things I have to do all week. <laughs> and uh, insofar as this is like a commitment and a job, and when you commit to reading a book, particularly a big book, uh, like 900 pages or so, there's an aspect of it that is, um, requires you to kind of to make an effort and to, to fulfill an intention that, that you make and to sit down and to clear a space uh, where your phone is not going to distract you or 
Um, you're not going to get, you know, be, be dealing with emails at the same time. And it really is a different, a different space. And um, so I think that what particularly in this, in this section of reading um, spoke to me or kind of provided that sense of, uh, I don't know, that sense of, um, I don't know, relief or that sense of kind of, uh, um, yeah, just distance from the, from the, the hecticness of, of the world. You know, I mean, things, crazy things are going on uh, politically and also, or, all sorts of ways. Uh, and it's, it's not an escape as, as much as, as it is a reminder, I think, of another level of, of, um, of reality. Uh, and that comes through in, in I think, uh, Lynn's experiences in the village you know, where he, he kind of like breaks down, right? I mean, that's what he says that happens to him is that he had not yet like come to, ter- to terms with everything that he had done, uh, with all that he'd left behind. Uh, and with that whole like broken or, or rended uh, network of relationships, you know, that, that, that he completely left, left behind. And then he comes to this place where that network, that mesh, of relationships is so strong and so deep uh, and there's so much trust uh, between the people that I think it like precipitates this like this crisis in him right and and then and the flood that that the monsoon flood uh, sort of is like the almost like the swelling like the intensification uh, of of that crisis uh, and he freaks out, right? Everybody's laughing at him because he thinks that the flood is going to take over the village. And they're like, no, we've lived here for, you know, thousands of years. We know exactly how the river works. And, you know, you're, you're being a silly, crazy Westerner uh, again. But it's like, it, it's sort of, it's almost like that fever breaks or some like that, that alienation, like that, that fever of alienation breaks uh, in him. And that becomes when he's, you know, when he gets that, the new name. Uh, Shantaram uh, from uh, pr- Prabh- Prabhakar's mother, right? Um, so that was really interesting because it, it comes with all those rains, it comes with the monsoon, it comes with the, you know, the, that kind of crisis and that, um, you know, that like mortal fear. Um, and, and then perhaps that begins to, um, that kind of presages you know, how he's going to approach things in the rest of the book. I don't know. I haven't you know, read it all, but like with the fire, um, that becomes like a kind of real crisis, right? I mean, that's something where he has to act in a way that he didn't in the village. And, uh, and, he, and he turns toward it, you know, and he, and he, and he jumps into the fray uh, with the other inhabitants of, of the slum. Uh, and, uh, and then, yeah, then he moves on. He meets this mobster guru guy, which is very interesting. I agree. We're just to get, I get, getting the initial story on that now. But there's definitely some kind of like realization going on uh, in this, in this um, you know, mafia boss. And there's also like a father figure. There's like a family structure that's like reconstituted there where Abdullah, uh, who had saved his, if not saved his life, at least, you know, intervened when this, mad sword swordsman uh was coming after uh him just out of nowhere in that uh was the den of the standing babas anyway we got we got to talk about that um (laughs) that was bizarre uh so i never even imagined that any anybody would did that um but but anyway, those are my initial impressions, I guess, of it. And, um, and I've, I've, I really found it to be a, um, just something I look forward to. And, uh, and, I'm, and I'm glad that we can take this time to like, reflectively kind of take it, you know, rev- kind of retrace our steps. And, like, where have we been in, in this book? Because uh, I do it, in, I, mean, I read in the midst of my daily life, sometimes just before bed or you know, lying on the couch for a few minutes or after eating. And so it's sort of, I get it in these little drips and drabs throughout the week. And then uh, I may have a few pages left before the, re- you know, before our talk. And so I, re- I read those like earlier, um, but then like to put it all together and to like, you know, get, get the other points of view on it um, really helps to integrate the whole, the whole experience. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. So, um, 
Yeah, this is very rich um, section for me and evocative in terms of memory. Um, I, in, in my time in India, um, I opted to, to sort of leave, break with tradition of some of my fel- fellow travelers. We got to the city uh, where we were going to be spending a lot of time in a, one particular um, spiritual community or ashram. Uh, I opted not to sort of live in the comfortable air-conditioned, you know, condominiums or hotels that were in and around the ashram and were certainly affordable by Indian rates, but um, actually just milled about, you know, um, kind of a long walking, just maybe a mile or so away from this particular uh, spiritual community where I'd be going every day um, and didn't fully take into account what that would mean in terms of my net experience doing that, that mile long walk or what have you, but actually just rented where there's uh, this particular, um, part of Bombay is already sort of at the outskirts. So when I go to the outside of that particular district, I was really getting into just living among um, the, the, the average you know, Indian family out that way. And some were living in huts and some folks had um, found places within um, the kind of earliest, most modest forms of, of apartments. And so I rented a space there and, and started living this year by these daily walks, both in the morning and and later in the evening. And, and so um, not just that, because then later I really did hit village life, et cetera, but that was really the introduction to, to um, what is uh, at times frustrating, but mostly in my case, completely lovable about the, the incredible um, um, good heartedness and vivaciousness of these people who from our own Western perspective have so little, but, but um, enjoy so much of, of, um, of their lives and, and, and open those lives up so readily after some of these awkward initial rituals. So for me, getting into the story, there was the, you know, um, the highlights for me sort of in summary, I mean, the, the train travel, there's nothing like it. You have to do that when you get there. And, you know, I don't know, Pam, if there's a, a way to spin the story that would ever convince you that it's worth the, uh, the crush and the sweat and, the, and all of it. But but he does such a great job of capturing the paradoxical um, modulation that these folks do um, culturally and energetically to compete when competition is necessary and it must be fierce, given the, the sheer scale and odds and numbers, and then to completely return to the level of um, um, kindness that, um, that is required for those that many people to cohabit. And that's paradoxical, that's incredible. And um, for those of us who read the whole book and without giving spoilers away, at some point there'll be a wonderful diatribe in the future. I think in the future, unless it, it rolled past me already, where, but I think in the, in the future where DDA will hold court and talk about, um, you know, that it would just be sheer bedlam and murderous mayhem if that many French people were packed into living in one area. And so, you know, this... Uh, yeah, they've had that. Yeah, yeah. we had that. Okay. Okay. Good, 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 good. So in any case, so there's the train trip, which just is amazing. And and of course, the, I'm from Minnesota, Minnesota nice. You know, I'm a, you know, a good, little, a good little mama's boy from Minnesota. So of course, I've given up many a bus seat, a train seat, whatever. And it just, just literally parallels the incredulity all around <laughs> Lynn when he dared to insult Prabhaka. And then everyone else joined in and, and agreed how insulting that would be. So, um uh, the transition into, you know, arriving in the village, of course, is, is via that great encounter between um, uh, introduction of Prabhaka's father and Lynn and the wonderful little crazy um, differences in presumptions of intimacy. Touch my belly one time. Oh, that one not going to hurt you. That belly's a number. You know, so, you know, <laughs> so going into that whole... Uh, introduction and, and the presumption of intimacy in the unique way that, that, that Indian culture allows for it. And, you know, his playfulness arriving in the community and finding his way in. But um, I was similarly touched to um, and reminded of the ways that this happens there. Um, people staying up the night with Lynn. I remember making my way through some very cold, through some very cold nights in Kashmir, living in a you know a, a slum, literally on stilts on the swamp, swampy backwaters of Lake Srinagar, 
And, uh, you know, they took turns in the night, you know, keeping a little bowl of coals lit and putting it under my blankets and rotating and whatever. So very, uh, very uh, touching for me. And then village life, of course, uh, you know, we, you know, just amazing to see him get that sort of initiation. Um, and, um, and the transition, you know, back out of that life, all the awkward <laughs> passages, you know, Prabhaka trying to do Lena solid by hooking him up with that gorgeous prostitute. <laughs> Prabhaka couldn't control himself and Lynn couldn't bring himself to imagine the possibility of uh, consorting with with that that opulent, uh, well-experienced, what did Prabhaka say? Like, oh, this one, number one experience, this one, thousands of men, this one expert or something. But anyway, just uh, incredible. And so this, yeah, the cycle in this round of reading through village life was my, my reinitiation um, uh, into owning um, how much India had given me, um, and then of course, really my falling in love with this um, with this book and this this story. Yeah. Yeah. David, I'm so glad that you brought up like a lot of the funny things that happened in the book because I laugh hysterically reading it. Just some of the jargon <laughs> and the way that Pravaka uh, speaks is so funny to me. And- Pam, I have like the complete opposite desire. <laughs> Reading this book makes me want to go there even more. <laughs> you, you remember when Kavaka was trying to organize that first bath for him and he screams like, yeah, yeah, you, yeah. You, you, you know that's your under underwear. And then yeah. you might get your over underwear. Oh, that's one. Underwear. Yeah. Oh yeah. my God. It's just so funny. Like I, that is one of the things that I just love about culture. I had a girl from China stay with me for a little while and it was just really interesting how different it was. Um, but, oh, and you'll get these scoldings also for, you get these scoldings from, from a people who collectively approve. If you come in and out of a major city in the morning um, on the trains, you will literally like say one hour before work and everyone is kind of doing their morning whatever showers and and whatever they can do you will literally be non-stop for at least 15 20 miles outside of for example bombay or mumbai um mm-hmm. be nothing but just an endless stream of cute little butts squatting down in fields pointing their nether regions toward the train <laughs> because they wouldn't they wouldn't point those toward the village for a number of reasons um, <laughs> reputation tradition whatever but every passerby on the train it's just, <laughs> it's just you know so you get to, you get this initiation to transcending certain certain personal personal uh, elimination mores or I don't know how to to, to, to oh, language yeah. it appropriately um, but in any case it's just a uh, mind-blowing so funny and like uh when Pravaka said that that they wanted to watch him do his elimination I was dying like oh that's so funny <laughs> and then David just thinking about you having to walk a mile with how much you love meeting people and conversating that had to take you hours <laughs> <laughs> Incredible. That to take you hours. You love meeting new yeah. people and talking, so that yep. that's funny. Yep. You just have you just have to imagine the um, the uh, character of the sweet car salesman before he gets too upset in Fargo. At the beginning, oh yeah, they're really optimistic. Yeah, well, we're gonna okay then. Yeah, you know, so you know, so stopping at every little Chai Wallace stand and you know, doing the Midwestern net, net, networking. Yeah. Um, Marco, do you want to initiate the next round of inquiry? Well, I, 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 I'd love to hear a little bit more, uh, particularly if you have any insight into this, into um, some of these really uh, unusual uh, kind of esoteric or ascetic, ascetic um, cults and, and mm. practices. Because, I mean, to me, that was one of the weirdest and... Starting uh, babas. I mean... F- all surreal um, uh, aspects of, of, of this uh, of this part of the reading, uh, the standing babas who are uh, I, I wrote this down. He wrote comprehensively, like constantly stoned. They are smoking <laughs> charas all the time. That they can't sit. They cannot sit down. They have to sleep standing up. Like it's part of their uh, religious faith uh, and part of their penance or part of their way of. Like reconnecting to the absolute, that uh, they have to undergo this, you know, tremendous um, uh, ordeal uh, mm. that swells their legs and, to, you know, to 
grotesque proportions. Uh, and, uh, and then, you know, after a number of years and shrinks them, I mean, they go through physical transformations for this. Uh, and um, it's understandable that they'd be smoking pot all the time um, because it sounds like incredibly painful. It sounds like submitting yourself to like constant torture. Uh, so, I mean, the CIA could, might dream up things like this. Um, right. And, uh, but something about it seemed to work. Like mm-hmm. something about it is working for them. It, it's uh, the scene is interesting and exciting. Uh, and, uh, and then this completely, you know, random thing comes out of nowhere. This swing, this person swinging a sword around. So anyhow, I'm very curious about that, that scene because it just struck, it was so striking to me. Uh, and, you know, I've heard of some of these kind of ascetic groups, but I haven't really taken the time to, to think about it that much. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Fakirs, I guess. This was a form, a kind of fakir. Yeah, mm-hmm. yep. And specifically this aspect of um, demonstrating the transcendence of mortal identification through some form of mortification of the body is, um, I mean, it, I mean, forget Delhi and Bombay. I mean, you could just spend years there, um, you know, cataloging the strange corners and caves and um, seaside shoals you could visit where, you know, groups of eight to 10 <laughs> devotees are pursuing one or another form of incredibly bizarre self-denial. I mean, everything from simply, you know, growing your, your, your finger and toenails so long that you can't live in any kind of a normal life. You know, you have to be, you know, fed or, or fast, et cetera, to all, all manner of, um, you know, denials on both um, reception and release faculties of bodily existence. So whether it's, you know, completely amazing diets, diets or absence thereof, you know, um, folks who are, revered as not having taken food in years and, and what in, was involved with that. The other end of the scale is a little bit more, I don't know, uh, you know difficult to describe in, in public circles, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's fascinating, curious, incredible. Um, but one thing that India consistently does in this domain that I can say in general, or the effect that all of this had at me is it, it's, um, it's, India is like, um, especially in these outlying, you know, extreme examples, it's like the the limit case for credulity <laughs> for our Western vision of like what it is to live a human life. I mean, truly um, demonstrating practices that show that there is no way that you could go to sleep to um, or get comfortable with your your existence, and, and I mean that's a, you know, and there's a lot of ways that there's a lot of ways that they do that. I, I could certainly give some further some very bizarre examples, but the other thing that I can only I can only um, bear witness to with um, sort of the apology that you know I was as young as I was and impressionable as I was, and you know, also. Um, seeking to be sensitive to the subtle energetics of these kind of goings on that there is a range in my experience from sort of um, showmanship um, for the sake of, you know, donations and survival or whatever. So kind of just as, as vocation, if you will, almost like a circus act mm-hmm. all the way out to um, different forms of yamas or niyamas, different forms of, you know, affirming certain practices or resisting the participation in certain, um, what we consider to be mm, average human indulgences or, or, you know, what have you, that actually um, in the presence of, of folks at this other end of the spectrum who are deeply sincere, um, you're coming into a field, a very rare energetic field, which is, you know, I register as a bod- bodily felt sense. There's, a, there's an inherent sort of reverence coming into the space of someone who is, let's just say, who has just been a very, very deep, meditator you know this person wakes up three times a day for about an hour a day or wakes up engages relationships engages bodily functions and then sits back in posture and so as you have like some people actually just you know pushing kind of the 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 envelope of just how much sheer sort of I mean, pros and cons you know spirit spirit dominated hyper masculine ascended i mean all criticisms aside for a second it's incredible what uh, what an energy field that builds for um, something that is transpersonal 
entering the field, that there is some uh, mysterious alchemy to self-sacrifice mm-hmm. that, that can, under certain circumstances, I wouldn't have make pretense to be able to qualify or describe, lead to an absolute state of um, collective reverence. And so it's not as simple as seeing sort of the carnival babas or the sort of silly beggars and then projecting that onto every other sort of extreme practitioner and then saying, well, India is just mad or India is just crazy. No, you, you can come by some, by some little village neighborhood temples um, where, um, where there's just, a, just very intense and austere forms of practice have been going on for generations. And there's temples that have not stopped you know, ringing, you know, ringing a bell or performing arati, performing um, ritual puja, have not stopped for generations. I mean, someone has been there nonstop, lighting a light, saying a prayer, acknowledging the divine in all beings, calling the divine in in, in that form, or whatever. And I, I get goosebumps again just to remember what it was like to to come into the, you know, and sit on a little corner of the polished stone and just, you know, be able to become part of the milieu and the energy field for a period of time of such sincere, you know, um, devotion. Mm. Yeah, that's be- that's beautiful. Mm. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, actually, when you first started talking, I immediately started thinking about Native American tradition and sun dance and, I mean, vision questing, all of those things, you know, are, are you know, forms of sacrifice. Not to the ongoing degree, it sounds like in Indian culture that they do, where they'll, their whole life will be, like, standing up, you know. But. Indeed. Mm. Indeed, no. Mm. It's, it strikes me as an aspect of creativity as well like that there, there's a boundless creativity to human spirituality or spirituality as such that it could take mm. these multi multifarious forms uh from you know the seemingly ab- absurd uh seemingly ridiculous to the more subtle or the more um uh, I guess relatable, um, but it's 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 interesting that I mean one I think see, one of the aspects of it is the concentration, just the, the sheer con- what you seem to be describing is just the sheer David is the sheer concentration of of um, devotional energy or of conscious energy, you know, into uh, like establishing, maintaining like some connection with a transcendental reality. And, uh, and that could take in human terms a very, it could take any number of forms, right? I mean, it could be through sound, it could be through physical uh, sacrifice, it could be through, you know, meditation, uh, there's all these different, different ways, but um, somehow or other, like, like, we get very creative around how, how, how we do that. And then, you know, that, that can become a tradition or it could become a cult or it could become it could start to create a field that wants to sustain itself and then, you know, takes people into it. Right. Uh, and I mean, one of the things about the Babas, right. Is that it was, it was also a means of dealing with, um, with guilt. Right. Uh, th- there are a number of people who do that, that as described um, uh, by Lynn, who were former, um, you know, criminals, they were re- repenting in some way, like they were seeking a way of restoring you know, penance. Their, their, yeah, penance. Right. Uh, and, um, you know, arguably there are uh, better, uh, you know, clear, more direct paths uh, to that, but maybe not. You know, it, it really is um, just like the, the kind of moral, moral relativism we talked about last week. Uh, you know, if you really put yourself in in all the conditions that, that somebody else is in and the pathways that are available to them and the need that is being expressed in, uh, in motivating a, a, a spiritual practice or austerity, uh, in, some, in, in one context, that may look like, well, I'm going to use 
brainwave entrainment technology and I'm going to meditate and, you know, I'm going to have an overall, like what we'd consider a healthy, balanced life and more so. In other contexts, that might look like, um, like extreme mortification. And, and of course, I mean, we're not aliens to that. And like Western culture has that as well. Because I mean, one thing uh, I thought of is, well, how is that so much different than like an Olympic athlete? you know, that practices over and over and over again, doing this one particular move. Uh, and although they don't have like the metaphysical system to go with it, there's some discrete uh, framework of meaning that is organizing like what that activity means and how that satisfies a, a, a deep need. Because you don't, you don't, you know, become an Olympic athlete or uh, exceptional in any field without uh, an insane amount of, of of devotion to a particular form, which may make cultural sense within a within your context, but from another may appear completely insane. I mean, if aliens were to come down and you know just see the variety of things that we do that we consider totally normal, they might think that it's completely nuts. Uh, and so, I mean, but that 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 drive, you know, that drive to um, to to, to be reintegrated or to be one with, uh, with the transcendent reality. Uh, it's, it's incredible how strong that is and how, you know, how, how, how much we neglect it actually a lot of the time uh, or how much it kind of gets dis, con, you know, uh, caught up you know, in, in a lot of like little ways that we try to satisfy ourselves that are, um, often unsatisfactory. Uh, so, I, I know, it's, 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 it's interesting. I, I was not at all relating to it on that level uh, before we started talking here. Well said. You know, there's a, a, there's a desert father tradition of that in the Christian tradition. I remember reading accounts of uh, monks who would stand on pillars and that was kind of their practice. Uh, I think, it, I don't remember, Stelle or something. I can't remember. I was going to go look it up. Um. Yeah, well, I, I, I know that for me, but again, it's, it's sometimes hard for me to separate what was India and what was just the phase of life I was in. Because I was at a, at a time of life where classically you're free to try anything and, and try on different identities. And I was, um, in any case, already, uh, you know, a by design psychedelic youth. So I had already wandered the, the streets of my own hometown, you know, with, you know, pupils as big as saucers, admitting to myself that none of this made any sense anyway in the traditional way it was handed. You know, sort of the the Western conceit of this illusion of familiarity through having names and really tight categories for everything. Well, yes, the neighbors and yes, uh, Protestant and yes, uh, you know, middle class and, you know, everything was kind of, you know, the mystery of everything was, was boxed into, you know, very safe and controlled categories. And then of course the finding the psychedelic doorway was the, was on the one hand, the return to, for me, the ecstatic um, experience of happiness of, of, of early childhood and maybe even a, a bit of an adumbration of transcendental or transincarnational happiness, like, ah, ah, yes, okay, the greater truth about the larger matrix in which we're, you know, being lived. But, but then, you know, there was a lot of attempts in my early years before I got to India for that to be, you know, I see how quickly, you know, um, travel, you know, you could readjust and, and kind of build maybe looser categories, but still, you know, still the, you know, we all kind of, um, for better or worse, or maybe naturally enough, um, you know, uh, life will adjust to give you itself, you know, in as many neat boxes as you really require to feel okay, as much of the mystery it was sort of one of my teachers called this the open secret. Uh, you know, fact of reality, which is that, you know, to the degree that you're, you're open, this ineffable <laughs> wonder of the mere existence of anything it becomes your experience. And, and, and to the degree that you're nervous and contracted and, you know, need, you know, deeply self-defined as a separate self, then of course, it's all just boxes and definitions. And, you know, the, you know, the navigation of that, well, India 
you don't have to be proactively psychedelic in terms of your you know your your dietary accessory agenda <laughs> to actually have merely walking down the street or, or or having the illusion that you have an agenda for your day <laughs> will set in motion and an unfolding equally as psychedelic as any uh, as any of the more profound uh, you know um, medicines in nature and so this you know making my way back into this book was um, I mean this was a book that you know. Or this is a book that keeps, keeps um, uh, I think, inviting us each to our own limits and across, you know, such a spectrum of human experience to, to, to stretch and be cracked open again to to feel um, at the heart of each thing onto itself. This uh, ding on sich for those of us who also do these <laughs> philosophical uh, circles, um, you know, this, the such, such nature of each of these um, experiences gets so, um, gets so magnified in how orthogonally different it is than Western experience in India, that just, just any, any day of being there provides opportunities to just stop and like, what? You know, it'd be like the first scuba dive if you had never seen a, a PBC or a Jacques Cousteau, you know, film or something, you know. How would you possibly, you know, incorporate anemone and, you know, stingray, et cetera. And then there's, you go to India and there, well, these are people. I, I, these are people. But but what, t- what time are we living in? You've got these layers. You have the British layer, which gave the illusion of sort of, you know, post-industrial revolution um, convenience and form and facade and technology. That, and then, of course, you know, like, like some, hist- some sort of strange history, they also are not there anymore and nothing has been reproduced. So then it's just maintained. So indeed, you're, you're lifting an old British telephone, but it's like it's been repainted seven times and the ear cups have been replaced by something that's been hand crocheted from yak fur. And so, you know, which arguably, if you drop the right amount of whatever hallucinogen in downtown London, uh, telephones can sort of do that. So. I don't know. I, I've lost my thread, but that's my rant on it. The big, the big thing I'm getting from this is it sounds like India is just a constant paradigm buster. It's mm. like you can't hold on to your boxes very easily being in, in India because it keeps breaking them open. I mean, obviously, probably you can't. Anyway, that's just interesting. You know, I think I kind of intuited that, but hearing you describe it um, and reading this book, you know, is sort of, I'm getting that sense about it. So, so what else then happens in this, in this chat, in, in these pages? He, he, he's also lost all his money, right? Uh, and uh, it's a little kind of housing crisis. Uh, this is what, um, <laughs> this is what leads him to this, to the slums. Uh, they, he's given a place to live there. Um, fire happens we covered that uh and then he's walking at night and there's this uh someone mentioned earlier the um the time that he's in the village at night and uh it's his first was it his i think it was his first night there where uh all the vill- the, the the family uh Pr- Prabhakar's family comes and and uh sort of gives pr- creates a kind of protective sphere or circle uh around him uh and then uh and then the night comes back again in when when he's back in in the slum in this very different kind of communal environment uh it's much more um yeah obviously urban but but dense uh type of environment but the environment clears out at night uh there's a curfew apparently it doesn't apply to him uh and and he's able to go out at night again um and um I don't know where I'm going with that. I'm just trying to try, trying to like make sure we cover all the ground in this. Uh, so, there's something there too though. I mean about this kind of raw just exposure to um to kind of the non-human, you know, to what's kind of the, you know beyond uh the the human sphere where uh the um 
I'm thinking back to, to, to this other book that we're reading right now. It's called Spheres. And one of the ideas in this book, Spheres, it's a, it's a, it's a philosophy book. To speak of the dang, ding on, on sick, the thing in itself, um, is, is that uh, I'm going to try to do some cross-pollinating b- between these two different groups because they're actually pretty, it's pretty interesting that there's the, like, you know, we were talking, we've been talking about how our sort of Western culture presumes a atomistic individuality and presumes a separation from each other. And if we're going to be in a community, we kind of have to come to it as individuals and join it in some way. Like if it's an intentional community or uh, like there's all kinds of communities, like meetup communities. I mean, there's all kinds of, we're all constantly seeking ways of, hi, by the way, <laughs> we're constantly seeking ways of, of being in community with each other. Um, but, uh, but we can't presume it. Like we, we, like what most, what many people in our cultural experience is broken communities, like broken coming from what we call broken families or, um, from like neighbor or places that don't have like a strong sense of neighborhood or strong sense of tribe, a strong sense of identity. And so we're constantly seeking communities and um, in this book, Spears, by uh, Peter Sloterdijk, he's, he's trying to write about, like, what are the, how, how do those, that sense of being in a, in a, in a sort of contained relationship uh, with others, how does that, how does that evolve in the, in the course of, you know, a human life? Uh, but then how does it, but also in the way that a culture uh, uh, unfolds and in particular our culture and what 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 the, where, where he ultimately goes with that although i haven't read all the books but i know kind of the architecture of, of his work is that uh we start out in these very intimate spheres with basically with our mother uh we're at first inside of her body and uh and we have this kind of primordial or this original sphere that we have with her we're inside of the womb and we have a relationship with like the placenta and when we first come out then that's our first relationship we, do, we don't become any anything or anybody without first having a um a, a dyad with the mother and then and that starts with a, being close to her body uh with breastfeeding or feeding uh with falling asleep on, on the mother. And then it starts to, you, our, our spheres start to grow out into other relationships. So it may extend to the father or to siblings and then into larger and larger um, uh, containers. Uh, but we always find ourselves in, in, in these containers. And what has, what, what's kind of happened like with what we call modernity and with our modern world is that all of that's been kind of divided up and we have this kind of rational, like you've been saying, like dividing up of the world and dividing up of ourselves into not so much like spheres or containers that are intimate and that are connected, but into like boxes or into like kind of separate um, kind of this, you know, this kind of these points in a grid of like a mechanistic world where we have to compete with each other and we have to kind of figure out, you know, who's, who's uh, ahead you know, who has status, who has money, who has power, et cetera. And um, in some way we become, I, I hope this is not too long of a rant or too, no, it's not a rant, but a discourse, uh, but uh, that we, w- what Sloterdijk is arguing in, in Bubbles, which I'm trying to connect to, to Shantaram, is that we've kind of become what he calls a, a core without a shell. So we sort of lost that enclosing, uh, embracing type of experience that is part of uh, traditional or indigenous uh, cultures uh, and is even part of like our original experience as, as humans being born. And we end up being in this kind of like exposed, it's like naked to the universe, naked to the non-human, because there's something really important about having the container just like a fetus needs to develop inside of a womb 
like we also need to develop inside of kind of these larger wombs, if you will, like these larger containers that, that protect us and allow us to mature until the time that we get, we grow beyond it. We get too big for it and we move on to other, other containers, but we've lost a sense of how even to create those containers. Uh, and, and so we don't experience them uh, and, and, and anymore. We, la- we feel like this kind of lack or feel this kind of desire for, for reconnection or for coming into community or like there, there's some kind of generalized sense of, um, of a kind of hunger for, for that intimate relationship, right? And for that sense of being, being contained, being one. I, now, I don't know, why, why am I saying that? Because uh, um, I, I, was, I was struck particularly by, by that scene um, with, with uh, Lynn uh, in The First Night in the Village where the night would have been, I mean, would have been so, so uh, dramatically uh, uh, intimidating or something, you know, like to be like with the infinite and not to have that human warmth around you. uh, It was like, that that was something that the villagers instinctively understood, but we don't even, we can't even understand that because we don't experience the night. Like we don't experience that kind of, that, open vulnerable exposure to the infinite like the infinite is somewhere else it's not like what comes every night in the you know in the display of 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 the uh, cosmos of stars uh and and vast you know vast space in all directions uh and how terrifying that actually is to an awakening mind and then how important it is to have that uh, that kind of sphere of, of relationships around it that kind of create a sense of create a sense of human warmth that create a sense of warmth because it's kind of cold. It's a cold universe in that, in that, in that sense, the infinite is so crazy. Uh, and, um, so unimaginable. I don't know. I'm just, I'm riffing a little bit on this. I I don't want to, I don't want to kind of go on too much about it, but I'm trying to kind of get to some sense of like what, um, well, I'm trying to connect it to other things I'm reading, but also like maybe, you know, like what's really the need that we're, we're trying to serve and um, like, you know, what, what, what is kind of just the kind of underlying like thing that's like driving, you know, just driving this whole drama. Uh, that may be a vague way of saying nothing, but, but um, I don't know. You don't have to reply to it in any particular way. Uh, I, know, I know it might just be going kind of out there, but uh, whatever. That, that's what I have. <laughs> that's, that's my my um, my reflections. You know, I don't know, but I know that I want both. I, I mean, one of the ways I connect with the infinite is by being alone. Uh, I, I like when I'm more in a present awake state of being outside and looking at the stars and it opens up for me that sense of, of that I'm not alone, that I'm connected to everything. I mean, you know, just being in nature does that too. So, and maybe it's probably because I'm a nine on the Enneagram. I, you know, if I'm around people all the time, I lose myself. So I actually like to not be around anybody. And I love being in nature by myself because then it's like, and then I can just expand and feel that, that deep sense of not aloneness of connection. I guess. So I'm busy going in another direction from what you're talking about. No, but it, you're right. Actually. I mean, that's interesting. You're out in the, the desert. Like you're, you're like, you've, you've sought out like a, that, that um, just vastness, right? And it's comforting to me. It's not, it's weird. It's, I mean, I like, I remember once being out, John and I were busy trying to taste the Cambrian of a cottonwood tree. We read back in our survival days that it was edible. And we look over and there's a fox across the creek watching us. And I had such a sense of comfort to just be 
another animal doing something while another animal's watching me. You know, it made me feel a part of everything as opposed to, you know, the human running everything, I guess, or thinking it's the center of the universe. So I don't know if this is anything to do with what you're talking about, but that's kind of where I went with as, as you were talking. Well, maybe there's different drives. I mean, maybe, uh, I mean, there's a kind of person or per, like there's maybe a time in people's lives where they really feel drawn out of that communal embrace, you know, into the wild, into the desert. Yeah. yeah. Like to meet the infinite maybe, uh, or to be like, to be outside of that human sphere, human container. Uh, I mean, that certainly strikes me as, like, yeah, I really, when he's walking outside by himself, I love that scene. I was like, yeah, <laughs> it's quiet. There aren't people around. And that vision of the Sikh temple, you know, the way he described that and the pathway and how the water covers it. Um, I, I just, I was like, I, I want to go there. That place I want to go to. I just thought that was really, really cool. I've actually been doing that like for the last six months is I've been getting up at I've been getting up early in the morning, sometimes three in the morning, four in the morning, uh, going out walking like that. Yeah. Uh, when everybody is, is asleep, there's no cars on the road. Uh, and that's been like one of my main forms of meditation uh, has been doing that and having, like, it, it, you actually have a different space in which to think uh, and you have a different way in which to feel. Uh, when you don't have all the interference of the of the human world, uh, I mean, even just cars driving around is like creates a field. It creates a field effect of like interference that I think affect changes what you're even able to think or what you're able to process. Uh, and it seems like that's what he's doing too. At that in those in those scenes is, um, I mean, maybe maybe he's like still like working on like this sort of new identity that he's coming into as like he's in his new with his new name and um with kind of you know facing again you know, like what what he's been through in his life and th that becomes also the prelude to the, to his finally telling what happened in in terms of escaping the prison um and uh so i i i, I guess it's um I'm, I'm interested to see what happens next because it sounds like this is all a bit of a prelude to uh, to his next set of adventures, and um, now these kind of got in with the uh, the guru the guru mob, uh, mob boss, uh, who's also, by the way, a different. Um, I, one thing I'm actually would like clarification on. Maybe David, you could help with this before we wrap up our call. Is um, there's the Marathi language, right? And that's pra Prabhakar's. Uh, uh, tri group um, what would you call it not tribe exactly but a uh, the, people. the region uh, the region I don't actually I don't want to interrupt your question okay. I'm, yeah please okay and, that, and then there's there, there's uh, people from different regions but then there's the, there, there's the, the Muslims as well and I know that there's historically conflict right between the, the Hindus and the, and the Muslims in, in, in India uh, I wonder how does that play into their you know, what's going on here because uh, they seem to be getting along. I mean, he seems to be able to go between you know between these different groups, and they seem to you know getting to, to getting along together, even if they have different kind of you know, sectors for the crime you know, that, they, that they control. Uh, is there any, anything that we need to know about that for just background understanding what's going on? I think from the standpoint of, of being a Westerner visiting India it, in the way that we experience Lynn doing it, the, my experience, you can move as a visitor in and out of these um, subcultures um, pretty, pretty readily. It's trickier for people who are honoring tradition, familiar, familiar, <laughs> a family, a traditions of, of, um, of uh, the, the, 
the cycle of celebrations and the way that cities will share space so that different subcultures and religions can take over and all kinds of complexities of cohabiting um, that you don't really, you're not really touched by when you're just passing through um, the way that, you know, the way that I did for a year and a half, the way that Lynn does now for um, years to come, et cetera. But um, no, so you could just as easily decide, you know, if you were living in, in Bombay for a few months to spend, you know, weeks at a time just getting to know more of the Islamic um, subcultures and, and visiting mosques and all that. But then you go through periods of time, perhaps if they're long enough, um, where there was tension between those groups and as a visitor, you know, that has an impact. But, you know, there's language domains and, and you know, food domains, you know, so culinary and there, you know, there's, you really, you really can move into such, through such a variety of subcultures across all the lush, you know, sort of experiential ways they express um, in such tight proximity. It's pretty amazing in that way. I was also going to um, just speak to, I, I felt like it was a very interesting um, lens, uh, this, this aspect of, of, um, bubbles or or concentric you know um rings of relatedness or self-identity or what have you i think it's an it's it's um it struck me that that or it had me asking the question like wow do you um does each new expansion into like transcending a particular previous definition of being somehow bubbled relationally bubbled um require a certain kind of rupture, Lynn rupture, in a sense, his identity as an Australian, his identity as belonging there, or, you know, maybe even for all the years he was in prison, you know, developing different forms of relationship that sort of encapsulated and he learned to survive within, however, you know, um, inhospitable or or um, inequitable, um, then there's this rupture, he escapes, and then there's this period, this interface space where he, you know, is, uh, you know, is an entity, is a core without a, a sphere somehow. And then you know, India, and you can see him in some of these awkward early conversations, almost like intellectually over prying. He presses Carla too far um, a little bit at first to understand her employer and her backstory because he's trying to figure out practically how to, you know, what will be his inroad to sort of rebubbling or re reframing and belonging in a unique way that he can or will. Um, so I think that's, uh, I was really glad that you went on that um, tear because I think that that's, um, that's kind of a, a really um, helpful new way to look at um, the, um, the rhythm of his, um, of his rela- periods of relational outreach and the adventures that happen that way. And then the counterpoint in this narrative, um, we get a lot of introspection, a lot of this pulling back in and, you know, um, him reflecting on himself, his inability to meet the joy with which he is being met sometimes and the shame around that, um, insights into what it is to be a fugitive. Um, <laughs> uh, there's a group, there's a bubble that wants him back in Australia and defines him as belonging to a very, you know, intensely and aggressively, you know, boundary, you know, punitive, um, you know, uh, you know, um, societal uh group and 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 wants to manage his and curtail his freedoms around that and and so um all of this is i think a really great way to be um engaging with the story because it's going to bring so much more richness to super paradoxical moments coming up when he makes when he considers for example re uh identifying anew with a with this for example this criminal subculture that we're just being hinted at now and um, and how could it be that a person who has suffered at the sharp end of karma for having done wrong, you know, being imprisoned, um, breaks free? You'd think that that's a lesson learned, but then it takes a subtle character like we're going to meet in the case of this mafia boss who is going to begin to draw him into different ways of interpreting right and wrong. So this is going to be, um, it's, we're well set up for some really fascinating discussions to come. Hmm. Okay. Um, I, I I would like to ask, since maybe in the last few minutes here, uh, just some reflections on how we could, how we can, how we can go in our in our next conversations. Uh, 
I haven't come into this with a huge, with you know, master plan about you know, what what to talk about exactly and you know, specific questions to ask. Uh, and you know, one of the things that I like doing in these groups is opening it up and seeing what's there and what wants to what really wants to come out, and then playing with that, seeing how it connects. Uh, and I know that my own instincts uh, can kind of o- oscillate between the text and some kind of interpretation of what a character is doing or what a particular event means or uh, things that are unusual. And then more of like a self-reflective sort of what does this mean spiritually or what does it mean philosophically? Uh, and I, I'm curious how, where you feel like this maybe, I don't know, how, how do you feel? What, what have you felt is, is like maybe fruit potent or um, promising uh, areas in which to go in, in a conversation in a space like this? Uh, and like, how what might we come back in, a, in our subsequent or, or coming conversations to like make them more, um, like more, um, make them really helpful, like right? You know, to, to our actual, like our actual needs or what we're really here for. Right? We came to read a book together and there's a story that we're unpacking and we're going to kind of peel it layer by layer, like, like the onion. Um, but somehow this is also, and I think we've also, we've talked about it and I've certainly talked about it as having some, like being a kind of a practice unto itself, like being a kind of spiritual practice, right? Like reading and talking about what we're reading as a kind of practice. Uh, and so how, what kind of intention can we bring to that? And what, like, how can we clarify what we're really seeking in, in, you know, what we're doing together? Uh, you know, now that we've had a couple of weeks and we have some of the same faces, uh, uh, I'm curious, you know, because I don't always know. Like I'm, 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 I don't, I definitely, it's not only I always know, I almost never know <laughs> is I think more accurate. Um, and uh, sometimes I feel like I can get kind of, you know, into my own thoughts and my own particular sphere, my own particular uh, interpretations, but um, maybe lose a sense of like really where the group is and, and how it all wants to, how it all wants to manifest. I could chime in only to say that um, structurally, I would, if people feel inclined, I would, I would love it that we could explore um, that, that possibility that, that the circle feels enough trust um, and the container is um, sufficient to be able to, for us to more deeply confide um, in each other what this book touches relative to to the cutting edge of our self-understanding or our growth or in what ways is it a goad and what ways is it a balm um i'm i'm just um i'm really loving that you took it there that you took the conversation there structurally marco and i feel it as an invitation that i'm just i'm just saying yes yes here um and um, not knowing Paul or, or you, Pam, very well, but immediately knowing so much by the few shares that you guys have already um, uh, already um, brought into the circle, um, I, I feel all the trust in the world to, to in our next meeting, um, entertain what kind of more, um, more structural questions uh, could we entertain in this category about, re- about deeply personal relevance of of why this book showing up in our life at this time and what, what kind of deeper things is it touching? Well, I notice I'm liking that we're approaching it on multiple levels, a philosophical level, um, you know, uh, being able to just note certain uh, events, uh, scenes, and, you know, how that might make us laugh or otherwise affect us. But then also if we're bringing in um, how it resonates or how it might um, uh, affect our stuff more deeply personally uh, in that sense that um, I know I could confide how the elements of the book certainly um, have been moving me or how I relate to it now. And just sit, saying with that in that confiding too, um, I'm more than happy also to make sure that what we say in the group or confide in doesn't get beyond our, our group here. I wouldn't be talking about anything that anybody else might happen to 
share on a deeply personal level, um, just to sort of bring that piece in for the container of the space. I agree to, to everything that everybody said. I love um, like how Paul had said that there's definitely different layers and um, just different conversations happening. I love to hear what people, what the book evokes out of them. And then also David's tidbits about um, being in India and just kind of painting that picture for us and, and hearing how true it is, how much the book aligns with his uh, experience. So that's super fascinating and interesting. Um, so yeah, I agree. I, I would love to go on all of those different angles. It's my two cents. I think for me, uh, you know, part of the reason that I wanted to do this really was because I'm sort of driven in work mode a lot. And, um, and I wanted to, I wanted to read this book and join this group to sort of help shift me shift my state, at least have a time and a place that's different than that. Um, you know, Marco, when we interviewed you for Spirit Tech, I was really, it was sort of like you kind of woke back up that part of me that loves poetry that I don't read typically these days, you know. So so that I, I think that was probably the biggest impetus really for me joining this, was wanting to wake that part of me back up. You know? hmm. And I notice with a book of this type that's so rich and there's so much content and so many layers that I know I'm experiencing it through my own filters and I'm very intrigued by all the various takes, the, you know, the various facets, the way into the book. I'll be taking with me through the next week the sense of these bubbles, spheres, or containers. I know that's now resonating in me and thinking about that in my own personal context and through reading the book. So... That'll be something I can tell will um, inform my reading. It's hmm. great. Okay. Yeah. Um, on that, the bubbles. Uh, D David mentioned that bubbles rupturing, and that is that is something that Peter Sloterdijk, the philosopher, talks about. And of course, you know, uh, uh, a birth is a rupture rupturing process, uh, and. Uh, Perhaps one of the things you know that one of the things I think I, I feel is that on a personal scale, as well as on a much larger kind of global scale, that there's some kind of rupturing process happening, uh, and we're kind of being birthed into bigger spaces, into other spaces. Uh, part of what I'm trying to do is understand that, like, and like what the f is going on, you know, and because it it's it's at the same time ecstatic and you know, revelatory and terrifying and dangerous, it seems like, like, like birth is. Uh, and so thinking about spheres, thinking about these kind of journeys that an individual takes in a literary sense or as a, as a type of hero or anti-hero um, and the kind of journey toward realization that uh, seems to be that that's implicit in, in those movements. Uh, to me, it, 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 like, I don't know why we're not all thinking about this because it, fe it feels so, uh, so uh, like urgent to me. Like this is really what's happening. Uh, and the book, to, like one way I look at the book, I'm interested in books for, on their own sake, but they're also like occasions. Like they give us lenses, talk about things that are real for us. And that's the interesting thing about fiction is that it's, it's, a, it's a lie that tells the truth. And so what... <laughs> Is that like what is that truth? What are what what's that truth that that we're all sort of interfacing, kind of grappling with? Uh, I I I haven't really articulated this perhaps adequately, but somehow I, I want to get to it. Like and somehow I want to like like be able to um, integrate it in some way, you know, and and share it, you know, like share that understanding with, with others, because uh, to the extent that I walk at night in the middle of the night and I'm communing with it, uh, I have incredible, all these insights, you know, like I, I, I and they, they seem to get lost. Like they, they seem to get lost as the layers of daily life, you know, in, encroach and then take over. And I have to like save them and I have to like kind of bring them into an intersubjective space 
that gives them language and gives them some kind of like, like reality uh, to make it part of my life. Uh, and so uh, I, you know, I'm just trying things like this is a book club and it's almost just desperation for me because um, sometimes I feel like reality is so weird and what's going on in the world is so crazy that like we have to kind of do something to get a handle on it. Uh, and the meditation is huge. I, I meditate with like I awake tracks all the time. I do my own other, other kinds of meditation walking. It's like, it's a, it's a big task to, to deal with what's going on. Uh, and, and also to kind of see, all right, well, from some perspectives, what's going on is just what's always been going on. Like, uh, you know, that, that may be part of what we're going to learn. Uh, there, there seems to be some wisdom in this, in this mob, mob boss that like to, to be able to inhabit, uh, these very contradictory positions, uh, is interesting. Uh, so I, I do look forward to, to that. And, um, but I do, uh, but I also do want to try to articulate just what the purpose of all this is, uh, at least like a, at least for me and, you know, what I think others want as well. Like what I think if, to the extent that anybody wants to do this, like, you know, wants to get out of work mode or wants to get out of the sort of hyper, hyper normalization of, 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 uh, of, uh, of our kind of like social reality uh, and everything that we experience in our sort of internet media enabled lives. I mean, to, to kind of be able to sort of jujitsu that a little bit and like engage in the technology and engage in the social networks and do all that, but then like turn it into a, a, a way of connecting instead of um, kind of fragmenting and tearing apart uh, I don't know exactly how to do that. I'm, this is an experiment, but I, I, I want to kind of put that on the table is like that there's some intention here that we're not just reading a book. Like we're trying to, uh, you know, we're trying, we're trying to live better or if that, that that's a, a noble enough goal, uh, which, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I think that answers itself. Anyway, beautiful, beautiful. Thank you for bearing with me too, because I know I go on these. Sometimes I get really self-conscious, and I feel like I'm digging myself into these holes. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to get myself out of them. Um, <laughs> but just the fact that you're at least smiling uh, helps. Well, this is my first on. Um reading group with with other people and i have to say i am getting a lot more out of it than i ever thought i would i wasn't really sure what to expect and especially like i'm a novice at reading these types of books i was a little bit intimidated and self-conscious too but i feel really comfortable with the group and marco i think you do a phenomenal job don't be self-conscious <laughs> and i can't tell you how to feel but um you I think you're doing a great job and I'm getting a lot out of reading or listening and hearing what other people are saying. And, you know, I never thought about why am I reading this book at this point in my life, but now I'm like, Oh my God, the wheels are turning. It's making sense. I have a feeling there will be a trip to India, you know, in the next couple to few years. So, um, yeah, it's, I think that everybody's uh, really inspiring. Cool to listen to everybody. So that was that for me. Cool. Cool. Thanks. Um, all right. Well, that would be very interesting to, to talk to you after you, after you've gone. To India. <laughs> yeah. After, yeah. I mean, I feel I mean, like it's interesting to talk to you now, but I mean, if, if that actually happens, that would be very, it'd be very interesting to, to just trace how, how like reading the book might influence your, your experience. Yeah, I'm sure it's, it, it is influencing a lot um, for the reasons that Pam doesn't ever want to go or like the reasons why I'm like, oh my God, I need to go there. I need to be around people in that kind of community. Who knows? I mean, maybe I, I won't like it, but I mean, David's journey being there too, that's really inspiring to me as well. So, um, you know, we'll see. I, I want to do a big trip in India is definitely on the map and it's becoming more and more important for me now after reading them. So. I'm reminded of Boulder sometimes and sometimes derogatorily re referred to as the boulder bubble. <laughs> so if you're breaking the boulder bubble, you're rupturing out of that into, into some bigger bubble. 
yeah. <laughs> we'll see. All right, so should we call it um, a meeting? And uh, look forward to next week. Uh, same time, same bad channel. Um, we'll have to talk about maybe meeting in person too, David. Uh, yeah, that, that would be great. That would be great. Maybe send some three of the members, and of course, little Bodhi, Bodhi with his cameos. But three of the members are here in this house. We could just have you over here. <laughs> And wander up to Upslope or our little winery up um, a block away and open up a laptop and simulcast with Pam and Paul and that sounds step good. Outside with a tea or a glass of some sort. Whatever yeah, that sounds good. Nice. Yeah, maybe next week. We'll talk. Thank you. All right. Good. Thank uh, you, everyone. Really all right. Thank you. Really wonderful. Bye, everybody. Thanks so Bye. much. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs> you got to teach us how to do that. <laughs> There's the some subtlety to it. <laughs> you can be sarcastic with it accidentally. That'll change the whole, that'll change the whole bus ride, I guarantee you. <laughs>